Oh, hi there. You just caught me reading one of my top three favorite book series, Wings of Fire, a series about funny dragons who learn the values of friendship and teamwork, go off on adventures exploits, defeat the forces of evil, become eco-terrorists, have healthy relationships, get educations, have childhood trauma, fight in 20 years of endless war, racism, and force their fathers to kill themselves by making all their inner organs outside organs. Yeah, it's targeted towards kids, why do you ask? Exactly one year ago, I decided on a whim that would be very funny if I counted up all the war crimes in the series, and I have been suffering ever since. So make sure you've grabbed a snack and are in a comfortable position for the next hour as we examine every single war crime in Wings of Fire. Alright, the first step in documenting all the war crimes in this goofy series with silly jokes for kids is defining what a war crime actually is. John Lilly once wrote, all is fair in love and war, which is not true at all. War crimes are the no-nos for war, things you can't do legally during times of war. These are detailed and defined in several documents, including the Geneva Conventions and Article 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which will be the main source for this video, specifically the version on the United Nations website. If something that can be classified as a war crime is committed during a time of peace, it's just a crime. So most crimes during Arc 2, like Sword's failed assassination of Icicle and Vulture terroristic activities, will not be counted. I will be counting crimes relating to Darkstalker's return, however, because that was basically a prelude to all that war involving him. It even led up to a battle at Jade Mountain, so I feel justified. Scavenger crimes will also not be included as we are focusing solely on dragon crime. However, there will be an exception for Cottonmouth because of how ingrained he is to the crimes of Arc 3, which means Stone, Heath, and Rose are getting off incredibly easy despite starting World War Dragon. I would also like to point out that I am only human, so I may have missed some things that can be counted as war crimes and counted things that aren't war crimes as such. Please forgive me, this project has already driven me insane as it is. So with the definition under our belt, it's time for some war crimes. While genocide isn't actually a war crime, being a separate crime entirely, it is important to mention as Wings of Fire is practically built on the idea of genocide. Each arc goes further along the ten stages of genocide as outlined by Gregory Stanton. Arc 1, Nightwings plan to genocide the Rainwings. Arc 2, Darkstalker actively genocides the Icewings. And Arc 3 is post leafwing genocide with Queen Wasp still trying to kill them all once she learns they're alive. I've already placed a bet that a potential Arc 4 will have a genocide of some sort, and if it doesn't, that means the Dragon World is finally progressing. But also means I'm gonna be down a couple dollars. You don't have what it takes to kill me. The first topic on the statute is the incredibly vague willful killing. Great start. According to Lexology.com, willful killing is the conscious killing of civilians, wounded combatants, prisoners of war, medics, and war correspondents, aka journalists. I am also going to tack on soldiers taking no active part in hostilities in accordance with Article 3, parentheses 1 of the Geneva Conventions. So, for example, while Dune's death doesn't count because he attacked Scarlet first and never uttered anything close to a surrender, Kestrel's does because she was lured out on false pretenses and literally stabbed in the back. Alright, let's go. Right off the bat, the first war crime in the series comes from the first few pages of Book 1, where Byrne throws an unhatched egg off a cliff. Yes, you heard me, an unhatched egg off a cliff. A defenseless egg that hasn't even been born yet. This can't even be counted as baby murder, as there is no baby. It's just an egg. Hivter, who is stealing the egg, also dies, but his death doesn't count because he was, a uh, stealing the egg from enemy territory. Burn merely gave him capital punishment. But don't worry about him, we'll get back to him. Asha is also mentioned to have died from injuries sustained while taking Clay's egg via crossing a battlefield. We have nothing else to go off from this brief mention, so we really can't count it since we don't know what happened. So, first two war crimes and we haven't even made it to chapter 1. Great tone setter. Still not yet out of book 1, as during the Dragon at Destiny stay in Scarlet's luxurious Death Arena, the Nightwings swoop down and kill every single Icewing POW as a message, which was at least 8. Speaking of Scarlet's Arena, the whole thing is a massive war crime and is going to be mentioned several times over the course of this video. Definitely has some killing going on, may not be willing on the combatants part, but is killing nonetheless. Gonna only mark it once since you don't know exactly how many dragons died, but in real life it would probably be a lot more. As mentioned before, Kestrel's death count and book two. 
Despite being all about princess murders, Book 2 really doesn't contain many instances of willful killing. All Book 2 really has is attempted killings related to the war, such as the Talons of Peace attempted assassination of Webbs, which counts since they got really close to doing it, and Blisser manages to tag Webbs as he was slaying but he survives. Now some of you may be thinking about Orca and the whole of her baby murders, but nothing Orca does counts as a war crime because none of it was related to the war in any way. The Prince's murders are merely regular crime and therefore do not count. The only war-related murders in Book 3 are the two random Mudwing guards at the beginning, who I think were implied to be murdered by Deathbringer, but Dragon Slayer kinda contradicts this since he was in what I think is pre-possibility, so he wouldn't have had to take the rain slash sand tunnel to get the Ice Kingdom, so it makes no sense he would be at the border, but then it really is neither here nor there, so... Blame it on a different Nightwing. Book 4 Vengeance is dropped into a vat of lava after an unfair trial, Morseer tried to get the false dragoness of destiny to kill Starfly so it counts as attempted, and then we have the guardhouse scene! Where the Nightwings swoop in uh, and burn down an entire guard station. That, that 100% counts. Oh, wow. This will definitely be mentioned again. Book 5. Thorn kills Prey Hunter when it really wasn't necessary, and Smolder mentions all his brothers are dead because they made the wrong dragons mad, which is 100% referring to Burn. Uh, also, Burn had a plan to kill the Ice Wings, but that never went anywhere thanks to the Dragons of Destiny intervention. I guess that would be another thing for genocide. Four accounts of genocide, Book 6 and 7. Book 6 and 7 do not contain any willful killings related to the war, but Book 8 opens on more unborn child murder as Peril burns all the Skywing eggs due to be born around the brightest night. Cirrus also claims to have killed a lot, and though it is just glossed over, I will bet that several of those kills are related to the war, since he is also a chameleon who works for Scarlet and is part of the Talents of Peace, an active group in the Sandwing War. While Book 9's prologue did contain the deaths of Snapper and Abalone for unfair reasons, they cannot be counted as war crimes because they had zero relation to the war. Book 10... We'll get back to Book 10, but for the main part, there were no instances of willful killing. Surprisingly. No one really died in Arc 3 except for Hawthorne, but he doesn't count because he was combatant. Then there's the bit where Wasp believes Earwig and some soldiers to die, which does count, but they all got home safely, so yay. There's also that one brief mention about Wasp leaving no descendants of Queen Monarch and Monarch's mysterious absence from the series. I'm not saying she's dead because there's no evidence. But there's no evidence. Winglet's assassin mentions the first dragon Deathbringer ever killed was a random Mudwing who happened to be a prisoner on the Nightwing Island. Who was this Mudwing? Why were they on the secret Nightwing Island? We may never know. But what we do know is that it was probably related to the war, and the killing of POWs is a war crime, so this counts as willful killing. As does Deathbringer's assassination of Slaughter. Blister also orders an unconscious Quickstrike killed, which, even though Quickstrike was a combatant in the war, she was whores to combat, meaning this counts. Also, from Blister's perspective, Quickstrike is a civilian and has absolutely nothing to do with the war, which means theoretically you'd count this twice, but I'm only gonna count it once. Legend's Darkstalker mentions that Darkstalker enchanted a knife to kill a random Icewing every full moon, and since the Nightwings and Icewings are at war, this counts as both a hate crime and a war crime. And uh, that should be every count of willful killing. What about Darkstalker? Uh... Oh, these are pretty cool bananas. <laughs> Alright, elephant in the room. Darkstalker's demise. I've looked around the fandom a bit, and I get the sense that it's sort of controversial, with people saying Kinkinju is a murderer or that she's innocent. But I don't care about that. I'm only here to find out if she's a war criminal or not. The answer is yes. Even if you don't believe that this counts as willful killing, the use of animus magic in this case can be labeled as chemical warfare. The strawberry is for all intents and purposes poisoned. It can also be counted as torture slash causing great suffering, as Darkstalkers seem to be in pain during the transformation. Is this willful killing? I don't know. I asked my friends about it, and one reason that since he was still breathing, he wasn't dead, and another called it reincarnation. But the point is, you can all sleep easy knowing Kinkaju is in fact a war criminal. Alright, that should be it for willful killing. Uh, torture! This section is kind of a catch-all for all the other crazy things that happen in war not fully outlined in the Roman statute such as the mistreatment in POWs and other captured persons, torture, weird magic spells, no, I don't know, the Death Arena? Yes, Scarlet's Death Arena is one of the worst war crimes in the series, and it's a major location of book one. 
I'm only going to be counting it once since we don't know the exact amount of prisoners sent to the arena, but the number is probably in the thousands or hundreds, I don't know. It's, it's up there. However, I will be counting Gil's malnourishment separately since that was a special occasion and is stated as such in the book. Peril can also be countered separately since she herself is a torture device used by Scarlet. Going all the way back to the prologue of Book 1, Hivtar's death is quite dramatic for an egg thief, with Burns shredding his wings, stabbing him in the skull, and throwing him off a cliff where he dies of poison damage before fall damage. And then Burn uses Scarlet as a human shield, which doesn't really fit anywhere else, so catch all, here it is. The miserable treatment of the Dragoness of Destiny can count as a war crime since it was directly related to the war, and they themselves said on multiple occasions that they felt like prisoners. Because they kinda were. They would then be locked up again in Book 2 for really no reason, with Clay being chained up in a cave that is known to be floodable. While on the subject of Book 2, it is important to note that none of the torture Coral does on screen counts as it was all internal affairs. Regular murder for sure, but not a war crime. However, it is mentioned that she tortured her Skywing POW for information in Book 6, so she's still a war criminal. Book 3. Queen Glacier is mentioned to have dislocated a Skywing wings. A Skywing's wing. Skywing's wing. Queen Glacier is mentioned to have dislocated a Skywing's wing to get information. Textbook torture, and they really can't catch a break. And then the Nightwings. Oh, the Nightwings. Ugh. Biological experiments on the Rainwings, several counts of gross negligence with the false dragonettes in Starflight, burning down the Skywing guardhouse while blocking the doorway, throwing vengeance in a pit of lava, just... Ugh. Book 5. The Weirdling Tower. Last time I checked, being put on display in a museum is pretty inhumane. Book 6. Book 6 has no instances of torture. Book 7. Scarlet Magic's Hailstorm, her prisoner, into a loyal soldier for her army via Animus Magic, leaving him with indescribable trauma for the rest of his life. Foslayer was imprisoned for what was really just a misunderstanding, and then became an Icewing tradition. Truly the worst of fates. Book 8. Queen Scarlet decides to hold a coup. Oh shoot, we need to talk about Scarlet's coup real fast. Alright, so the Roman statute has a separate section detailing war crimes committed during a coup, which is what Scarlet does during the events of Book 8. Since the crimes are classified separately on the statute, then Scarlet gets her own section. Lucky her. Let's go through this chronologically. Phase 1. Scarlet gaslights Peril into helping her via magic brainwashing, which, funnily enough, coercion isn't on the separate coup list, so I'm gonna settle with committing outrages upon personal dignity. Then, Scarlet kidnaps Cliff to use as a hostage, which is in the coup section of the statute. Phase 2. Scarlet gatekeeps the Skywing throne from Ruby, killing and burning three guards in the process, not necessarily in that order, which we can count twice as causing great injuries to body and willful killing, since one of the guards was hoarse to combat via being unconscious due to peril. That's a run-on sentence, anyway. Phase 3 was to return to her position of being a girl boss, but things happened and her coup was foiled. Vulture also briefly has a coup in Book 10, but from what I can tell did not commit any major war crimes since the palace he was seizing was indeed a military objective. So good job, Vulture. But you're not out of the clear yet. Anyways, back to the regular war crimes. Book 9. Darkstalker's shut-up spell on an enemy counts since it's basically cutting off your POW's tongue. Book 10. As mentioned before, Peacemaker's birth can be countered as torture. Book 11 has no torture that can be counted as a war crime, but Book 12 reveals that Wasp experimented on her own kind to perfect her mind control, which, since she used later on for war purposes, counts. Book 13. The gang kidnaps a random hiveling to experiment on. Book 14. Book 14 contains no instances of torture. Book 15. Book 15 has more mind control, which counts as psychological torture, since we see that it is definitely negatively affecting Blue and Swordtail, with others also probably being tortured. Wasp is also said to push her soldiers past the point of exhaustion against their will, physical torture, and was in everyone's heads non-stop for what can be assumed to be at least a month, one count for every tribe affected. Also, Kibli and Moon used fire during the beach fight which caused pretty great injuries and suffering. But we're gonna, we're gonna get into the whole fire and, and that stuff, cause it's kinda complicated. In Assassin, Blister is mentioned to do torture, however we never actually see any torture in Blister, but I'm still gonna count it. In Deserter, Burn mutilates Dune, leaving him disabled for life. I can't really think of a clever transition, so let's just go to the next section.
Okay, so these two things don't really seem to go together at first, but that's because I am very much oversimplifying things. This section is the combination of six points on the statute that all mean almost the same thing. Extensive destruction of property, directing attacks against civilians, attacking civilian objects that aren't military objectives, launching an attack in the knowledge that it will cause incidental loss of civilian life or damage to civilian objects, attacking or bombarding towns, villages, or other civilian dwellings, and intentionally directing attacks against buildings dedicated to religion and the arts. So yeah, all kinds of similar points which is why they're all under one section. Discrepancies on what crime and action count as will be stated. Let's begin. Book 1 actually doesn't have any property destruction or civilian deaths, everyone in the arena was a POW, but in Book 2, the Skywings bomb the Sea Wing Summer Palace, which houses both military operations and civilian commodities such as a school, intentionally directing attack against civilians and launching an attack in the knowledge it will cause incidental loss of life. And I'm also going to tag on destroying buildings dedicated to the arts, since there was a library there with Ola Coral's writing. Books 3-4 all the Rainwings are civilians since they have no part in the war, meaning the Nightwings kidnapping going after them counts as attacking civilians. Book 5. Addicts burns down an orphanage as a distraction for war efforts, intentionally attacking civilians and extensive destruction. We're gonna skip ahead now to Book 10, as the other four books in Arc 2 don't have anything from the list relating to war. On page 34, Kibley mentions an explosion happened near Peregrine's home, leaving him deaf in one ear. We know nothing more than this, such as who did it and why, so I can't accurately count it, but it happened, so yeah. Then at the end of the book we have the Battle of Jade Mountain. Darkstalker absolutely knew what he was doing. He can see the future. There was a whole prophecy about this battle happening, but he still decided to fight the Ice Wings at Jade Mountain. He could have waited till they left and ambushed them, but nope. Slapping him with launching an attack knowing he will kill civilians, and intentionally attacking buildings dedicated to the arts, since he knew Jade Mountain would fall because of him, due to his future sight and the prophecy saying it would. Snowfall also isn't completely innocent of these either, since after learning Darkstalker is coming, she says, We're not going anywhere. We're ready to fight them, implying they also plan to fight at Jade Mountain, even if the random Nightwing didn't try to kill Snowfall initiating the battle. So for the sake of fairness, I'm convicting her of these as well. In Wingless Assassin, Blister kills Quickstrike, who, from Blister's POV, is a civilian. Book 11. Nothing. Book 12 has the burning of Bloodworm Hive, in which the Leafwings burn down an entire city full of civilians and schools and stores and other civilian commodities, leaving an unknown amount of dead Hivewings. Out of all these, this one is the biggest because the Leafwings knew it was full of civilians. You can argue if the Skywings knew the Summer Palace had civilians in it, but the Leafwings definitely knew. And then, in response, Wasp burned down their jungle, which she had also kind of done a hundred-ish years prior. So, uh, both of you get slapped with extensive destruction of property, attacking civilians, knowing civvies will die, and damaging the arts. With Wasp having two accounts of destroying the arts, since she believed the trees were where the Leafwings drew their power from, meaning she thought slash assumed they were of religious importance and historic monuments. Next section. You don't understand, Mac. I only know football plays. Tell me what's on your mind, or I'll splatter it on the wall and see for myself. Coercion is the act of forcing someone to do something they don't want to do. In war, this can generally be forcing someone to fight against their own people, and is on the Roman statue twice for some reason. For our purposes though, I will just be counting every act once. This crime is first seen in Book 4 when Moroseer threatens to kill Starflight if he doesn't tell the Nightwing Council what the Rainwings are planning. Skip to Book 7 where we have Pyrite, Knee Hailstorm, who was forced to fight against his own tribe because of brainwashing. Peril was also brainwashed to go against her current queen in Book 8, but we already covered that. Books 9 and 10, Darkstalker magically compelled an enemy to commit a second Sea Wing Royal Massacre, and the Nightwings to fight the Ice Wings because he had daddy issues. Book 11, Belladonna forces Cricket and Blue to steal the Book of Clearsight or else she'll kill Swordtail. And then comes the Breath of Evil. Mind Control 100% counts as coercion, so one count for every tribe Wash slash Codmouth got under their control, as we don't know exactly how many dragons were got. I want to make a special note about Hawthorne, who was slowly taken over by the Breath of Evil before losing his mind to it. Hawthorne is in a weird position, because he both does and doesn't count, as his mind was completely taken over before the event of Book 13, but the other mind used his body for a brief while to stop Sundu and the gang from foiling its plants. I mean, plans. I'm not gonna count it, because it was such a brief stint lasting only 12 pages, and Leaf Wings under mind control are already being counted, so why make a special case for this one guy who's definitely brain dead? Think two heads a traitor, want to slag 
big two head. Was Benator down with that? <laughs> oh. Defense, take a rest. This one is exactly what it says on the paper. Trials related to war and POW should be squeaky clean and completely fair. And while there's not much about the court system in Piri or Pantala, the courts we do know about are incredibly corrupt. Looking at you, Scarlet. <laughs> Funnily enough though, the only trial we see Scarlet judge, Kestrels, is actually not a war crime. This is because Kestrel was on trial for something not related to the war of Sandwich Succession, therefore not a war trial, and ergo, not a war crime. Webb's trial, or lack thereof, however, is a war crime, as he stole Tsunami's egg, which is theft slash kidnapping, directly related to the war, and a crime against the Sea Wing Kingdom. Unlike Kestrel, Webb's actually committed a proper war crime, but he didn't get a trial for it and was just sentenced off to death. And then he got stabbed. But jokes on all of them because he managed to beat the allegations and now has a proper job instead of being in a terrorist organization. Good job, Webbs. The last unfair trial relates to Vengeance's death. Vengeance was accused of disobeying orders by bringing glory to the Nightwing Island, a big war crime which we'll get into in the next section. The next action in a real world court case would be the hiring of lawyers and actually taking the case to court. But here, Vengeance barely gets to defend himself only getting three sentences out before being chucked into a pool of lava. That doesn't sound very fair to me. And you want to know something else that isn't fair? <laughs> to sum it up in one word, kidnapping. This one is a staple of Wings of Fire. Book 1 starts with the dragon and its destiny complaining about their six year confinement and then escaping. Once they do escape, Scarlet locks them right back up, but this doesn't count since from my calculations slash guesstimations, the DoD were squatting on Skywing territory, meaning Scarlet has full legal power to lock them up. Then, when they escape from her, they go right back to being confined in Book 2, with Clay specifically being chained to the floor. Books 3 and 4 had the Nightwings kidnapping Rainwings to do weird science on, which was at least 8 according to Kinkajou, and including her and Glory makes 10. They also get Starflight, but fail to get Tsunami and Sunny. Sunny is then actually kidnapped in Book 5 and is taken to the Sand Kingdom by Fierce Teeth, Strongwings, and Prey Hunter, and is then confined by Smolder and burned Weirdling Tower with Scarlet, who also counts as a separate occasion. The next occurrence is in Book 9, but we need to take a quick detour to Book 7 to state that Hailstorm's confinement, for lack of a better term, does not count, since he was 1, on Skywing land at the time of arrest, and 2, willingly went with the Skywing soldiers, letting Winter, a non-combatant, get away in the process. Alright, Book 9. Darkstalker locks Turtle away in his dungeon and takes away his wizard powers. Arc 3, skip to book 13, where the gang kidnaps a random hiveway, blah blah blah, already made this joke. Uh, then in book 15, Wasp rounds up all the Silkwings of Cicada Hive and confines them for future mind controlling. Luna and Dusky are also taken by Codmouth and tied up in his court. Legends Darkstalker, Foeslayer is taken unlawfully and confined the Icewing Caves, becoming an important Icewing tradition. And our first war crime from Legends Dragon Slayer, Sandstorm kidnaps and takes Sky, a non-combatant, as a present for Burn because he looks funny. It's important to know the differences between kidnapping and using someone as a hostage. With kidnapping, you just put someone in a place they don't want to be, and with hostages, you use that person in the place they don't want to be as leverage for whatever reason. The reason I bring this up is because... It's one more barge! Get it tonight or it's goodbye to him! David Jones is locked on the seabed! You promised tonight will be the last! Deliver or he sinks! Not all kidnappings are hostage situations, but most hostages were kidnapped, such as Queen Splendor in Book 3, who the Nightwings planned to use as leverage before they found out the Rainwings didn't really care, and Sunny, who Fierce Teeth planned to use as a bargaining chip with one of the three Sandwing Queens. Ostrich is taken as a hostage twice, with both times counting. Scarlet uses Hailstorm as leverage to get Icicle to kill the dragon as a destiny, with Book 7 being all about getting him back before Scarlet kills him. Scarlet does it again in Book 8 with Cliff, but this has already been counted. Darkstalker uses Kinkajou as a hostage to get Turl to reveal himself, Belladonna uses Swordtail as a hostage, Hawthorne uses Willow, and then Book 15 has like half of the main cast as hostages, or so Cottonmouth claims. They're basically used as bait for Sundew though, so I'm counting all of them. And then also in Book 15 we see in Links in Memory, <gasps> NO BABY HAILSTORM YOU CAN'T USE IT AS A HOSTAGE, THAT'S A WAR CRIME! Ice Wings really teach them young, don't they? But we'll get to that. All right, who's ready to go find the spy? Right behind you. This one relates to the improper use of uniforms and surrender flags. Now, the uniform one is quite hard to do in the Land of Dragons, as they are all uniquely different. 
but somehow the Rain Wings managed to do it. In Book 3, Glory and Jambu disguise themselves as Ice Wings to get an audience with Blaze, which counts as appropriation of uniforms. Some of you might argue that it shouldn't count because at first glance it had nothing to do with the war. They were just out there looking for Mangrove. However, I say it does, because Blaze is a key figure in the Sandwing War succession, and with this maneuver, Glory and Jambu have deceived the guards into letting them into a military base. With Glory also being fully part of the war at this point, and further deceiving Blaze into meeting the Dragonettes of Destiny outside, almost getting her killed in the process, it should most certainly count as a war crime, with Jambu being her accomplice. Mangrove can just get slapped with trespassing though, since it's never stated how he got in. The Rainwings do it again in Book 4 when Liana and Grandor disguise themselves as Nightwings during the Rainwing Liberation slash raid on the Nightwing Island to save the Rainwing prisoners, and was probably done in Book 5 when Jambu and Mangrove went to deliver a message to Blaze. However, since this one was done off screen, we have no idea of the specifics, so we can't officially count it. Surprisingly, there's only one instance of misusing a flag of truce, which was in Arc 3 when Hawthorne tried to poison Wasp's food with the Breath of Evil during a peace summit. I'm honestly shocked that this is the only time anything resembling the misuse of a flag of truce occurs in the series considering everything else. Such as... The way this is worded is incredibly confusing and made no sense to me at all on first pass. I actually got it wrong and thought it meant killing a traitors, but what it actually means is the act of perfidy. I think. There were not many clear sources about it, but I'm done losing sleep over it, so here we are. According to the Cooperation and Judicial Assessment Database, perfidy consists of several things including feigning an intent to negotiate under a flag of truce, feigning surrender, feigning incapacitation by wounds or sickness, and feigning protective status by use of signs, emblems, or uniforms of the United Nations or of a neutral or other state not party to the conflict. Basically, lying. The war crime part comes in when the liars kill the people they were lying to. I think. I'm still not entirely sure. Thankfully, none of this matters because there aren't any major times during Wings of Fire where lying in this degree occurs on the battlefield. If I did get this wrong and you have a gripe with it, please leave a comment with the actual definition of this phrase and I'll make an addendum video. For now though, I'm moving on. A runabout. I'll steal it! No one will ever know! In short, theft. Stealing. Uh, robbery, stealing, thieving, larceny, thieving, robbing, pilfering, you get the point. Instances of this can be argued against, since the inclusion of unless such destruction or seizure be imperatively demanded by the necessities of war. For example, in Book 15, a wasp seizes items held in Kibli's pouch into Nami's dream visitor because they're her prisoners. She, er, uh, fairly is a very strong word. Uh, she captures them in battle, therefore it makes sense for her to take their things, not a war crime. Now because of this specific inclusion, there are potentially several instances with good arguments that I won't be counting. For example, Book 11's main MacGuffin is the Book of Clearsight. The Leaf Wings wanted to seal it to put them on equal footing with the Hive Wings, since having knowledge about every future event is really unfair. Belladonna even says Queen Wasp has already read the whole thing, she probably even has a copy somewhere unless she's an idiot, and this is a very reasonable assumption to make. Equality, that's what we're looking for. So is stealing the Book of Clearsight necessary? I mean, kind of if the Leafwings wanted to win, but it's also a major theft of a religious object. Because of the legal gray area the inclusion of necessary brings, I will not be counting it. If you have a good argument as to why it should count, leave a comment and I'll put it in an addendum video. The last theft I decided to include on my list was the Nightwings taking the magic wall bracelets that let them cross the Icewing border without being gunned down. This is theft and is treated as such by the Icewings, but was it a necessary theft? If the Nightwings hadn't taken the bracelets, they would have all been killed by the wall, so logically taking the bracelets should be necessary and not a war crime. Well, in Book 14, the Pantalan refugees managed to avoid the ice wall by going far enough out to sea and circling back around. Which means that the Nightwings didn't have to steal the bracelets because there is a canon instance of a far larger number of dragons avoiding the wall with zero casualties. So you know what? I'm counting this one, because it was not necessary. Take that, Prudence. You're a war criminal now. How do you like that? Literally the worst character in the series. I planned it all along my ass. Wait a minute. <sighs> Bronchial tubes clearing. Asthma disappearing. Acne. 
remains. There will always be problems when applying real-world laws to worlds of fiction. The problem here is that almost everybody has a natural chemical weapon. So does every single instance of flame breath slash ice breath count as a war crime? No. Section 2B XX of the Roman Statute states that every weapon causing mass harm is illegal, provided that such weapons, projectiles, and material and methods of warfare are the subject of a comprehensive prohibition and are included in an annex to this statute. Which I'm going to interpret as meaning that if it's not on the banned weapon list, then it should be fine. What I mean is, since everyone during the war of Sandwing Secession had flames as ice breath except sea wings, then instances of those weapons being used shouldn't count as they are expected. However, since rain wings weren't part of the war slash weren't expected, they do count. Same with flame breath being used during the stealth team mission to Pantala. I'm also going to be counting uses of sandwing venom because, come on, how can you not? Now there are exceptions to my loophole, but we'll deal with them when we get to them. Alright. Book 1 starts with Burn stabbing Hifter in the skull, and it is stated that his streams cut off long before the echoes of his corpse slamming into the rocks below, meaning he died of poise damage before fall damage. Glory tags both Fjord and Scarlet, and Kestrel gets backstabbed with a poison tip weapon. Also, Peril. Peril is a nightmare. I'm just gonna count Peril in Book 1 as one count on chemical weaponry, since she was acting under Scarlet and only used in the arena, but the things she does in the rest of the series are still fair game. Book 2. Glory kills Crocodile and Blister tags webs. Book 3. During Glory and Kinkajou's escape from the Island of Night, Glory tags three guards and Kinkajou tags one. Also, Clay throws some chunks of burning embers down a guard's armor, which, while funny, still counts. Book 4. Okay, here's one of the exceptions to the fire loophole. So, Morrowseer sends the false dragon as a destiny in Starflight to a Skywing outpost to convince the dragons there to switch sides. They are making progress when suddenly the Nightwings burst in and burn down the guardhouse, blocking the entrance so no one could get out. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm counting this one. This, this is a textbook war crime. You'd have to be insane not to count it. I... I don't even need to explain it. Book 5. No, th no, there's still more in Book 4. I just couldn't think of a better transition. Another acceptance of the Fire and Ice roll is what happened to Queen Battlewinner, since it was such a physically traumatic event that left her disabled for life. During the Rainwing rescue mission, Glory equips everyone with sleeping darts to incapacitate the Nightwings without killing them. While well-intentioned, sleeping darts are a literal chemical weapon, which means I have to count it. Two things in the book that don't count as chemical warfare are Splendor spitting in Vengeance's face, which can be chopped into accidental, and Viper stabbing flame, also an accident and caused by the Nightwing's gross negligence and their volcano's copious amounts of OSHA violations. Book 5. For real this time. To kidnap Sunny, Attic set fire to an orphanage. Since this is tangentially related to the war, I'm counting it. At the final confrontation of the Sandwing sisters, Blister unveils her dragon bite Vipers, which wreck havoc, killing Burn and almost killing Clay. I will be counting them as chemical weapons since they employ venom in their attack. Book 6. There are no chemical weapons in Book 6. Or the winglets. Book 7. Hailstorm was magically turned to pyrite, and while no chemicals were involved, I'm counting it because of how much of a traumatic experience it was. Book 8. It is first mentioned here that the Skywings have a crematorium, and this isn't a one-off event because it's also mentioned in Dragon Slayer, with the text specifically stating, Dragons soared in from afar to drop bodies of other dragons in the smoking ravine along one side of the palace. This can be interpreted as Skywings disposing of dead arena combatants, which are POWs. Now while this is terrible, it doesn't seem to be a war crime. Nothing in the statute says the burning of POW bodies is a war crime, or even mentions how to properly dispose of them, and since they're already dead it can't be counted as murder or anything, so... Yeah... Book 9. Kinkajou manages to hurt Darkstalker for the first time in 2,000 years while spitting in his eye. This is also the first book where Darkstalker's Icewing Plague is mentioned. I don't feel like I have to explain this one. Book 10. It is mentioned that the three Sandwing sisters all try to hire Cobra, who refused on the grounds that an ongoing war was much more profitable for her. Since we have no idea if she actually did anything, I can't count it. But what I can count is Peril burning a random Nightwing to death during the prelude to the Battle of Jade Mountain. Self-defense, but a bit over the top. And then as said 25 minutes ago, Peacemaker's birth. Book 11. Sundu uses approximately 8 instances of chemical warfare. Trust me, I counted. Book 12. Sundu uses a blow dart to freeze a guard. Book 13. Oh, Book 13. Breath of Evil is revealed, I'm counting this three times. Once for Cottonmouth discovering, cultivating, and using the plant. Twice for Hawthorne poisoning Wasp with it, and three for Wasp using it to her advantage times four for every tribe affected. 
This covers every instance of Breath of Evil poisoning, because I can't be bothered with counting them all. The gang trials the cure on a random hivewing and then pop it in a bonfire to cure the other hivewings which then backfires in their face. And then at the end, Wasp burns down the jungle to flush out the rest of the leafwings. Side note, I love the part in Book 13 where Hawthorne is trying to get the exploration group to drink his tea, and hindsight is very clearly poisoned with the breath of evil, but no one really pays any attention to it and it's never brought up again. Just love how simple it is. Anyways, Book 14. There are no instances of chemical warfare in Book 14. Book 15. As stated in the start of the section, all instances of fire and ice breath count, so Moon, Kibli, and Lynx are now war criminals. Pineapple is as well, as he uses his venom on not just Wasp, but some random Hivewing soldiers on the beach. The team was also equipped with sleep darts, and the Hivewing used their weapons once or twice. Legends Darkstalker Darkstalker invents actual flamethrowers, and since they are dragon-made weapons, they bypass the fire roll and count as proper chemical weapons. And for the final chemical weapon, Ren poisoned Sandstorm's tea with rat poison, killing him. I know I said I wasn't counting scavenger war crimes, but Ren is a main character, and this action probably majorly affected the outcome of the Outclaws raid on Burn's stronghold, so I'm counting it. And that's the longest section of the video done. Now, for making fun of people. I fart in your general direction. Your mother was a hamster, and your father smelt of elderberries. Humiliation is a weird one to classify, since it can be quite an opinionated thing. Like, is Peril for getting Clay humiliating? It's certainly shocking, but is it degrading? Does Darkstalker's mind control count? Tundra's treatment a winner? Is that one even related to the war? I don't know, but here's some things that are certainly humiliating and degrading. In Book 12, Lady Scarab talks about Malachite and how Wasp parades him around, never getting to be himself. This is unarguably humiliating and degrading, and is a great baseline, however it doesn't count as a war crime since it has zero relation to war. In Book 1, Glory is treated as an art piece, not a dragon, which is the definition of degrade, and this counts since she is a prisoner of war. This can also be said as Sunny, as she is put up in a birdcage over the banquet table and is going to be given to Burn as a fixture for the Weirdling Tower. Other POWs set out to be laughed and gawked at include Queen Vigilance's prisoners from Legends Darkstalker. Burn's public obsession with Six Claws Claws also counts, with all the soldiers even having orders to cut off his arms when he dies and give them to Burn for the Weirdling Tower. Speaking of the Weirdling Tower, placing Scarlet and Sunny in said tower could also count depending on if you think this relates to the war. I think it does, therefore it shall be counted. The next war crime we've got on the list is... Oh. Oh dear. At the end of the day, Wings of Fire is a kid series, meaning there are absolutely zero sex scenes or anything relating to a sexual nature. Except for this one bit of peril calling us Scarlet, but that's like the one exception. So logically, that should mean there are zero crimes of a sexual nature, right? Well, in Book 7, as the gang is searching for Icicle, Winter and Moon strike up a conversation about the origin of their tribe's hatred for each other. Wait, Moon said, catching up to him. What are you saying? That Foslayer and Prince Arctic? They had eggs together? A Nightwing and an Icewing? Sounds twisted, doesn't it? Winter hissed, ignoring the stab of guilt he felt at the thought. Especially when you realize that Arctic would never have agreed to it. Would never have betrayed the royal family that way. Unless Foslayer threatened him with something terrible. But whatever she did, it worked. What this is implying is that the Icewings believe that Foslayer and the Nightwings kidnapped Arctic and, uh, uh, forced him to have Darkstalker and Whiteout. This is not true at all, and we the readers know this, so it can't count, but it's still a very interesting inclusion to the book. There, buddy, it's all yours. Wow, look at that. Hey, what about me? Child soldiers are another staple of the series, with everyone being guilty of it. But let's backtrack a bit. How old do you have to be to be a child soldier 15? It says specifically in the text, 15 is the cutoff age for child soldiers. So now let's pick a random soldier, uh, Riptide, and check his age. Oh look, that's a child soldier. How about Carnelian? Yep, that counts. Sundu? Yep, I think you get the gist. This is one everyone is guilty of. All the kingdoms, even 2,000 years ago, all the different groups, everyone, everyone is guilty of having child soldiers. Now, of course, there is the argument that dragons age differently than humans, and therefore I should evaluate this according to what age a dragonette becomes a dragon. 
If only there was a canonical instance of an age of maturity being stated in the text. Oh wait, in book 7, we are introduced to the Icewing Gift of Order, a wall that counts every Icewing's social credit score, with there being two separate charts for dragonettes and adults. And you want to know what the age of adulthood in Icewing society is? 7. Despite this, dragons under the age of 7, such as Icicle, are still sent out onto the battlefield, meaning the Icewings have no defense in the crime of using child soldiers. If we go by the age of 7, then yes, Riptide isn't a child soldier, but Carnelian and Sundew still are. The Sea Wings aren't even out of the clear yet because Anemone is bloody one year old and being trained in combat. Everybody is guilty of this, no matter what way you slice it, deal with it. <sighs> but now the question is. Which other fan favorite characters are child soldiers? Well, the best way to tell you that is through the medium of a song. So now I present to you most of, if not all, the named child soldiers in Wings of Fire. Make sure to pause the video if you want to see the specifics. Peril and enemy, Riptide and Tsunami, Marshall Ra, Umber and Crane. Got Starflight and Face Speaker, Glory then Deathbringer, all hives under 15. It's Ruby slash Tormaline, Briar and Blue, and Sky Pheasant, Pice, Sword, Tail and Moon. Vengeance and Slaughter plus Samson and Yen Vibrant, Indigo is Claws and Dune. There's Sirocco and Ral, St. Nettle and Menry, then suddenly it's Ghibli and Square. Agave and Crystal and Bullfrog and Gariel, who was definitely a kid. There's Hailstorm and Icicle, Luna and Pineapple, Fiercely Soul Slayer and Clay. Rickon and Darsaka, Strongest and Prey Hunter, Snowflow, Slayer and Soleil. There's five of these dragons still on the spin wagon, Carnelian, Cliffside and Reed. Winner makes four plus Ogre's more. I've run out of Ryan's proceed. And uh, that's it. That should be every single war crime in Wings of Fire. So, off screen counter that hasn't been mentioned until now, how many war crimes? Oh my goodness! Right, uh, well, we finally made it to the end after 40 minutes. Thanks for sticking around. Now, it's time to find out who's the biggest war criminal of them all. The way this will work is that every crime will be evaluated through three different categories. Crimes committed by every member of a tribe, crimes committed by institutions class administrations, and crimes committed by individuals. For example, we have the individual Peril, who is working with the Scarlet administration, as opposed to the Ruby's administration, and is part of the Skywing tribe. One of Peril's crimes was, uh, herself, specifically being used in the arena. So this crime contributes to Peril's individual count, the Scarlet administration's count, and the Skywing tribe's count. If a crime involves the tribe as a group, slash the tribe's government, such as the Skywing arena or the guardhouse scene, there will be no individual count since there was no specific individual committing the crime. Also, if a dragon is forced to commit a war crime, mainly the Breath of Evil mind control in books 13 through 15, the crime will be given to the dragon forcing them to commit the crime since coercion is in and of itself a war crime. If an individual commits a crime on their own volition, such as addicts in books 5 with the orphanage, the crime won't go to any organization, but will go to the individual. I hope this all makes sense, and if not, it'll hopefully begin to once I start talking about it. So, the total number of war crimes is 260. This is a pie chart composed of all the crimes and split up by tribe. Before I reveal which tribe committed the most war crimes, I'm going to give you 15 seconds to guess for yourself, starting now. If you guessed the Skywings, you would be wrong. The correct answer is the Nightwings, with 98 crimes committed by members of the tribe. The reason their total is so high is because I'm counting the 10 Rainwings they kidnapped individually, the Rice. If we counted each crime against these 10 Rainwings as just one instance, their total would be 61, which is still miles above the rest. Why? Well, it's because I can only count crimes that are seen on screen, and we spend the most time with the Nightwings, leading to a skew of data. This is why tribes with less screen time, like the Mudwings, only have two. The tribe that's the main antagonist is guaranteed to have more crimes than others. Interestingly though, despite being the main antagonist of Arc 3, the High Wings are only two crimes ahead of the Leaf Wings, with the High Wings being in the number 4 spot and the Leaf Wings in number 5. Number 2 and 3 goes to the Sandwings and Skywings, with 37 and 27 war crimes respectively, a 10 crime difference. Number 6 is the Rainwings, 
Number seven is independent organizations, so the towns of Peace, Wren, and Cottonmouth. Number eight is Ice Wings. Number nine is Sea Wings. Number ten is Mud Wings. And number eleven is Silk Wings, with only one crime that being Luna being a child soldier. This one is kinda iffy though, since she was acting under her own volition being part of the stealth team, but also all the queens were okay with it, so I'm just gonna count it to be a completionist. Switching to administration slash organizations, we have. Oh wow. Battle winner with one fourth of the total war crimes. Let's look at a bar graph of this data. An organized one. There we go. As we can see here, the Battle Winter Administration is a massive outlier in the data with 57 war crimes. Once again, mostly attributed to all the Rainwings they kidnapped. Darkstalker comes in second with 29 war crimes, mostly attributed to the 20 Icewings killed by his plague. Zooming in a bit, we can see Wasp in third place with the stealth team sent to stop her in... Fourth? Yes, the heroic stealth team comes in fourth place because of all the chemical warfare done during the escapade. Going back to Wasp, most of her crimes come from the mind control and the burning of all the trees. In fifth, sixth, and seventh place are the other villains of Arc 1, Burn, Scarlet, and Blister. The rest of the administrations don't really have anything of a note, so I'll just leave the rankings on screen for you to look at. But what is interesting is that Blaze's administration has zero war crimes, putting her in last place. In our case, this is a good thing. Good job, Blaze. You still may or may not have critically wounded Asher, resulting in her death, but there's no evidence, meaning you can keep your zero. For now. Moving on to individuals now, the Nightwings are still in the lead with Darkstalker having 30 war crimes coming from him. Most of this is from his own mind control he did in books 9 or 10, and actually just all the stuff he did during his very short term as king. Every war crime done under his leadership was done by him. The extra war crime comes from the knife he used to kill Icewings 2,000 years ago. Zooming in again, we can see that Wasp is in second place, again because of all the mind control, and third place is Sundu. Yes, coming in at 12 war crimes is Sundu, who is third place because of all the chemical warfare she did throughout the events of Arc 3. The rest of the top 10 is more understandable. Fourth place being Scarlet, fifth place being Mastermind, sixth being Cottonmouth, seventh being Burn, eighth being Blister, ninth place and interesting being Glory. Again, chemical warfare. I feel the lesson to be learned is that chemical warfare is a bit too common in warfare even when not counting flamethrowers. Tenth place is a tie between Chameleon, Kibli, Hawthorne, Addicts, and Kinkajou, with only four war crimes each. Here's the rest of the rankings. The Unknown Icewing is the one who used chemical warfare on Battle Winner. Don't think you can get away with it just because you aren't given a name. So overall, the top three war criminals are a mix of the Battle Winner Administration, Darkstalker, Wasp, and Sundu, which are mainly the three who actively participated in genocide. Can't say I'm surprised. The bottom three for administrations are Oasis, Pearl, and Morheen, each with one crime, that being child soldiers. There isn't really a bottom three for individuals, because at a point it just becomes groups of however many crimes were committed. So for everyone with only one crime committed, we have Clay, Grandor, Jambu, Liana, Prudent, Sandstorm, Glacier, The Unknown Icewing, Ren, and Luda and Cricket, who are kinda negligible because they were self-assigned child soldiers. What a crowd. So now that we have the top three and bottom, uh, many figured out, let's ask what book has the most war crimes in it? I'll give you 15 more seconds to make a guess. Remember, it's all 15 of the main ones, plus the legends and the winglets. Go. answer is book 4 the dark secret with 37 war crimes 20 of these are all the kidnapped rainwings and the rest are mostly the other things the nightwings do such as venice's trial and the guardhouse scene the rainwings and queen glacier contribute the remaining four in second place is book 15 the flames of hope with 33 war crimes with a little less than even spread between wasp and codmouth and the stealth team in third place is Book 3, The Hidden Kingdom, with 31 war crimes, again because of all the Rainwings. Fourth place is Book 10, Darkness of Dragons, almost all the crimes coming from Darkstalker. If I wasn't counting each Icewing killed by his plague individually, this wouldn't be so far up on the list. Fifth place is Book 1, The Dragonette Prophecy with 27 war crimes, with a mix of crimes done by the Skywings, Nightwings, and Sandwings, with the Towns of Pleasing and Glory getting into each. Sixth place is Book 9, Talons of Power with 26 war crimes. Again, the 20 Icewings because it is here that they are first mentioned and are actually seen. Here are the rest of the rankings. Books with zero war crimes in them are Book 14, The Dangerous Gift, and Winglet's Prisoner. 
One last thing before we move on. What are the rankings for the POV characters? Starting at the bottom with Zero War Crimes, we have Starflight, Sunny, Blue, Turtle, Winter, and Tsunami? Yes, somehow Tsunami managed to not become a war criminal, despite her whole personality being the angry one who will probably bite your face off. There was that one part in Book 2 where she attacked a Skywing guard, however, she had probable cause and didn't actually kill him. She was also a child soldier on the stealth team, but we can give this one to Coral since she had to sign off on it. Unlike Icicle, Winter doesn't appear to have fought in the Sandwing War. However, he was trained as a child soldier, but we can just give this one to Glacier. Blue was forced to do war crimes under Wasp control, but the Coercion Clause says we can attribute these to Wasp since she was forcing Blue to do harm. Starflight, Turtle, and Sunny I don't have much to say about, except good job in not becoming war criminals. Luna and Cricket both have a tentative one war crime each since they were both child soldiers on the stealth team, and I can't really attribute this to a queen since they were both acting under their own volition. The same can be said about Fierce Heath and Strong Wings. A POV character that actually has one war crime under his belt is Clay, that being throwing chunks of burning embers down a Nightwing's armor. Chemical Warfare. Chemical Warfare really gets everyone, doesn't it? Peril, Moon, and Snowfall are in a three-way tie with three war crimes each. Peril honestly should have a lot more, but she lucked out since most of them were done before the time frame of Book 1, meaning we can't count them, and Scarlet was kinda coercing her into doing all of them. All of Moons come from Fire Breath used during Book 15, and Snowfall, being Queen of the Ice Wings, can be held accountable for all the crimes done by the Ice Wings under her command. Thankfully, the only war-related things that have happened during her reign so far are the Battle of Jade Mountain and sending Lynx off to be a child soldier. Coming into the top 3 now, in 3rd place we have Kibli with 4 war crimes. Again, all of them are chemical warfare from Book 15. In 2nd place, we have Queen Glory. Almost all of hers are chemical warfare in one way or another, and also things done during her reign as queen, such as directing Lyanna and Grandor to disguise themselves as Nightwings, count. Finally, in 1st place, we have Sundu with 12 war crimes. Once again, almost all due to chemical warfare. Here are the final POV character rankings. So, which war criminals were punished for their crimes? Well, ignoring everyone who's dead, which frankly is most of them, the ones who have been punished for the crimes are Mastermind and Wasp. And I guess Darkstalker, but no one can decide on if he's actually dead or not. Besides him, that's it. Mastermind is currently stuck in quicksand, and Wasp was jailed along with all her sisters at the end of Book 15. Fierce Teeth and Stronglings were briefly imprisoned in Book 5, but they broke out and now reside in the old Night Kingdom, completely free. So just two out of the 26 war criminals that are still alive are being punished. I understand not punishing any of the main characters slash their allies from a writing standpoint because they're supposed to be the good guys and also victors write the history books, but whatever happened to Attix or Chameleon? Sure, Attix was mostly just a plot device to get Sunny into Burn's stronghold, but there could have at least been a mention about him in Book 10 when they went into the dungeon. Chameleon doesn't get off any better because the last we saw of him, he was knocked unconscious by Kinkajou and left there. He's completely MIA, not even a reference in Book 10's epilogue. Perhaps he'll be back for that potential fourth arc with a high probability of genocide in it. And with that reference to the beginning, we're done. That's it. That was every single war crime in Wings of Fire. It's over. I'm free. Uh, I would like to thank all my friends for putting up with my BS for the past year and give a big shout out to all the wonderful artists who contributed to the video. Thank you all so much for watching all the way through. This is the longest video I've currently made and I'm glad you decided to stick around till the end. It's been a year in the making and I'm glad it's over. Don't know if I'll ever do something like this again, but I do know that this was every single war crime in Wings of Fire.